journey of images close to art. A collision of ideas between the East and the West. Seen from the modern Chinese standpoint, what happens when the Louvre meets the Forbidden City? of museums is held once a year in Europe. On that day, over 2,000 European museums, including the Louvre, open free of charge to visitors until midnight. It is a rare opportunity for every art lover to experience these fantastic works at night. At 12 a.m., the night of museums draws to a close. Meanwhile, 9,000 kilometers away, in Beijing, it is six in the morning. Two hours from now, guests will be greeted on a brand new day. Today, cultural relics from the Louvre are being brought to the Forbidden City in Beijing for the first time. These fine works of art of the Napoleonic period will be exhibited at the Meridian Gate. across thousands of miles are being connected. The East and West have been brought together through art. An encounter between the Louvre and the Forbidden City has begun. Isabel, sculpture researcher of the Louvre, is the curator of the exhibition of Napoleon I. She arrives at the Louvre at 9 a.m. every day. And through the Cour Pouget and Cour Mali, she walks through a door steeped in history and art. From imperial palaces to public museums, the Louvre and the Forbidden City shared the same fate.
The scaffold stands a few steps away from the ruins. A cylindrical basket covered in leather was placed where the king's head was going to drop to hold it. Distinguished French writer Victor Hugo described the scene of King Louis XVI execution in the French Revolution in his book, Shows You, Things Seen. At 10 a.m. on January the 21st, 1793, amid people's fanatical shouting, King Louis XVI was brought to the scaffold by the revolutionaries. Perhaps he wanted to have a last glimpse of his home, the Louvre. Yet the scaffold he had himself helped design was very effective, leaving him no chance. The last Chinese emperor, Hu Yi, shared a similar fate. But he was lucky compared to King Louis XVI. At 4 p.m. on November the 5th, 1924, Pu Yi was driven out of the Imperial Palace by the National Revolutionary Army, led by Feng Yuxiang. On October the 10th, 1925, a plaque reading the Palace Museum was hung over the Gate of Divine Might. China's largest museum of ancient culture was established. Although the entrance ticket cost half a yuan, the entire population of the city was thrilled. Over 25,000 people came to visit on the opening day. The once restricted imperial area has been open to ordinary people ever since. The Imperial Palace and everything in it became antiques for people's appreciation. The national treasures hidden behind the high palace walls were revealed before the expectant visitors. first founded, the Palace Museum was greatly influenced by the construction system of many Western museums, including the Louvre, which was also transformed from an imperial palace to a museum. On August the 10th, 1793, one year after its founding, the Republic of France announced the Louvre's official opening as the Central Art Museum. The Grand Gallery connecting the Louvre and the Tuileries was also opened to ordinary French citizens for the first time. Looking at the art collections that once only emperors and noblemen had been able to see, people were amazed, thrilled and enchanted by their beauty. From the castle built for war by King Philip II of France in the Middle Ages, to the imperial palace, modified by 27 kings over 600 years, the Louvre finally became the world's first modern museum. This was a major cultural event in human history. The era of museums began at that moment.
artworks should nourish one's mind and cultivate artists. Art should belong to the nation, not any privileged man. In 1793, Jean-Marie Roland, the interior minister of France, made such a declaration in the Louvre. Such ideas of freedom and equality for museums were championed in Europe at that time. Yet, the process of republicanism had been changed by a man called Napoleon Bonaparte. He brought a brand new course to the Louvre. Recently, Isabel has been busy preparing the exhibition of Napoleon I. She's making an inventory of all the sculptures to be brought to Beijing. These are all typical works of the Napoleonic period. Donc en fait, cette, ce, ce buste de Napoléon a été créé pour être placé au-dessus de l'entrée du musée, bon, voilà, qui était dans la cour Napoléon. Euh, et l'entrée le, du musée, a, le musée à ce moment-là a été baptisé Musée Napoléon. In 1799, Napoleon was elected first consul of the Republic of France and moved into the palace of King Louis XVI. Four years later, he changed the museum's name from the Central Art Museum to the Museum of Napoleon. Napoleon knew that his governance was not very stable. His reputation came solely from his battlefield achievements. So he considered it absolutely crucial to make his people remember his outstanding military exploits. In ancient Rome, only triumphant generals were entitled to pass through the triumphal arch. The Triumphal Arch is a memorial of war and glory. Napoleon advocated ancient Rome's heroism, which was in accord with his own great ambition. In 1795, he built the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel in front of the Louvre. The relief sculpture on the Arc de Triomphe records Napoleon's victories against German and Austrian emperors. However, it did not show battle scenes, but scenes of the signing of peace treaties. This shows Napoleon's superb propaganda skills. The more wars he launched, the more he advocated peace. sketch of the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel will be exhibited in the exhibition of Napoleon I in Beijing. The exhibition will be held at the Meridian Gate, the front gate and largest gate of the Forbidden City. The Meridian Gate is the Gate of Rights, where emperors issued imperial edicts and held ceremonies. After the triumphant return of generals, ceremonies and presentations of captured prisoners would be held here. It was an important way for Chinese emperors to record their victories and military exploits. Yet, one emperor considered it insufficient to record his achievements. He took a much broader view. Mm -mm -mm -mm. 
passé. Hein, c'est euh, une gravure française du 18e qui est réalisée d'après des dessins qui sont faits par des artistes qui sont des jésuites européens en Chine. Et à la demande de l'empereur de Chine, justement, qui adresse sa commande au roi de France, Louis XV. Les peintures murales représentant sa conquête, ses conquêtes, donc dites de l'empereur de Chine. L'ensemble des dessins ont été remis à la compagnie française des Indes pour être envoyés à Paris pour être gravés, avec une demande officielle de l'empereur adressée au roi de France. It was the first encounter between the Forbidden City and the Louvre. Two centuries later, the exhibition of Napoleon is connecting the two palaces once again. Isabel often goes down this long, narrow passageway to the basement sculpture department to examine the artworks. Et vous avez la Joconde ici. Petite Joconde. Vous pouvez regarder la Joconde, mais c'est une Joconde pour les exercices, les exercices de sécurité, pour les exercices des pompiers, pour les exercices des pompiers. Pour les tests, pour les tests d'accrochage. No other work of art can match the Mona Lisa's popularity. With her enigmatic smile, she seems to be the spokeswoman for the Louvre itself. No matter what angle she is viewed from, she always seems to be gazing at you. It seems that Napoleon also liked the Mona Lisa's eye expression very much and used to hang the picture in his bedroom. Nowadays, it's impossible for anyone to have such luck. In the room of history, Isabel's colleagues take down this small plaster model of the triangle lintel of Cor Carré. It was completed in 1813, so is almost 200 years old and is very fragile. It will be part of the exhibition of Napoleon in Beijing. This is a model of a Cour Carré triangle lintel sent to Beijing. The one now standing in the middle is Apollo. Yet before the downfall of Napoleon, he used to be the one standing in the middle. Facing the goddess of wisdom, he turned himself from a soldier holding a weapon to an emperor advocating peace. This diminutive fellow who achieved power on horseback loved art and projecting himself in various art forms as a soldier, a general, an emperor, and even a god. He was used to appealing to others emotionally with specific images, whether to promote himself or to reward court officials. Yet, Emperor Qin Long of the Qing dynasty had a different view of himself. This is Dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains, 
one of the ten classical and famous drawings of China, painted by Huang Gongwang of the Yuan Dynasty. Emperor Qianlong wrote more than 70 prefaces and postscripts about it. He wrote more than 20,000 poems during his lifetime, showing his love for poetry, paintings and calligraphy. Napoleon hoped to present himself as a god of war, then Emperor Qianlong wanted to be seen as a refined and elegant scholar. Like Napoleon, he also had a strong wish to preserve his works for posterity. His writing can be seen on the dwelling in the Fuchan Mountains, the plaque of the Hall of Supreme Harmony, the four feet brush pot, a jade carving of Dai Yu taming the river, and the rockwork in the Summer Palace. The emperor may have gone to extremes just a little, yet an autograph was a Chinese tradition. Western people preferred the direct experience of specific images. They left various sculptures for posterity. Whereas Eastern people prefer words and left many plaques as reminders for themselves and as warning signs for posterity. Children living in Paris are very lucky. The Louvre has become a place of learning. The instructor is analyzing the painting, The Coronation of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, by Jacques-Louis David. On December the 2nd, 1804, the coronation of Napoleon was held in Notre Dame de Paris. He became the emperor of the first empire of France. Napoleon had this moment recorded permanently. This large painting, 6.1 meters wide and 9.31 meters long, depicts 191 characters. David had drawn sketches for each character. The original design was Napoleon crowning himself in a bold gesture in front of the Pope. However, in the end, he changed his mind. To show that he had gained power all by himself, he asked the painter to draw him crowning the Empress instead. Having spent half his life on battlefields, Napoleon compared himself to Alexander the Great and preferred works with ancient Greece and Rome as subjects. At the time, works of neoclassicism were springing up with the idea of revitalizing the spirits of ancient Greece and Rome. These works of art were strict in composition and large in size, in accordance with Napoleon's taste. Music 
Although many paintings were used as political propaganda, the combination of politics and art finally created many magnificent classic works, full of heroic passion. Being used to sceneries of mountains and water, how would Emperor Chien Long feel about these passionate works? Napoleon portrayed himself as a heroic emperor through large paintings. How did Emperor Chien Long express his ambitions and emotions? This enamel porcelain bowl was made on the orders of Emperor Chien Long. It depicts pavilions, pagodas, and birds flying in the woods. Verses are written in the blank space. The emperor had perfectly combined poetry, calligraphy, painting, porcelain, and enamel craftsmanship, and pushed porcelain-making techniques to an extreme. Enamelware originated in the early 17th century and reached its peak in the late 18th century. The most striking features at that time was to present landscape and bird flower painting skills on the porcelain body's arc surface. Emperor Chen Long pursued excellence in meticulous and complicated crafts. From glazed bottles of different colors, which combine 16 crafts and are called Mother of Porcelain, to the Jade Mountain, weighing 5,000 kilograms. All exude the Emperor's lofty sentiments and high aspirations. As emperors, both Chin Long and Napoleon's passion for art was not as simple as that of ordinary people. To them, art should express the emperor's political purposes and ideals. Tuesdays, when the Louvre is closed, are the busiest days for staff workers. The positions of the exhibits of the exhibition of Napoleon have been left vacant. Isabel is supervising the workers, replacing them with exhibits of equal stature. Only on Tuesdays do the 40,000 plus exhibits of the Louvre get to enjoy a little peace. Each work here has its own story, or even era, to tell us about. gained victory on the battlefield, Napoleon had thousands of tons of artworks shipped to the Louvre. The Grand Gallery became jam-packed. On each wall hang three rows of paintings. In spite of this, such a massive collection of Europe's art treasures is unprecedented and pioneering. A large number of artists rushed to the Louvre 
In the early 19th century, the Museum of Napoleon had already become Europe's eternal art center. In China, meanwhile, scholarly looking Emperor Qianlong appears in this painting. He had turned his personal interest into a massive collection cause, and a collection catalogue had been compiled. Yet the emperor never regarded art collection as purely a pastime. It was always associated with profound political purposes. During his reign, an unprecedentedly massive number of national treasures were gathered. Almost all the top artworks in Chinese art history were brought to the Forbidden City. Around 5,000 war trophies captured by Napoleon were returned to European countries after his defeat at Waterloo. But a large number of masterpieces remained in the Louvre in perpetuity. The largest existing painting at the Louvre, the wedding at Cana, is one of them. Napoleon's war trophies were returned to their respective European nations. But the Chinese emperor's collection was scattered around the world in the nation's turmoil and upheavals. Today, in Chateau de Fontainebleau, in the Parisian suburbs, people can still see these porcelain bottles, palace lamps, and Buddhist murals from China. Most of them came from the old summer palace. On May the 5th, 1821, Napoleon died at St. Helena. An era passed with his demise. It's a fact that Napoleon stimulated the development of the Louvre. In the 160 years after Napoleon's demise, the Louvre underwent many changes. Before 1989, it was like a maze for tourists, with narrow entrances, blurry signs, and 224 confusing rooms. This was changed by a man born in China. Iu Ming Pei, an American architect born in China, was one of the most successful architects of the 20th century. He has a deep-seated background in ancient Chinese culture and always wanders between traditional and modern elements. In 1981, the French government launched the Grand Louvre project to reconstruct this old building. Pei's pyramid design gained support from President Mitterrand, but was strongly opposed by 90% of the French people. During the eight years of construction, the sound of questioning and criticism never stopped. But even under great pressure, Pei stuck to his original design.
when the pyramid, composed of 793 pieces of glass, was revealed in 1989, the French people accepted it. The reconstructed Louvre is well illuminated and its exhibition space has been doubled. It's become a real, modern museum. In 2009, a three-year reconstruction project was carried out at the Louvre. The Forbidden City is also going through a reconditioning process. The Meridian Gate has become the Palace Museum's regular exhibition hall. The exhibition of Napoleon is about to open. Isabel, who has come to Beijing for the first time, is making the final preparations for the exhibition. Tomorrow, people will get to appreciate the brilliance of a man and a palace through these sculptures, paintings and tapestries. People of different times have different understandings towards the same items and cultural relics, let alone people from different regions and cultures thousands of miles apart. When the Louvre meets the Forbidden City, two brilliant cultures encounter each other. It's possible that during the encounter, new meanings will be created. It was a mysterious land that glittered in the mist of history. The first light of human civilization appeared there. It was a turbulent place with frequent changes of regime. While China stands in the east of Eurasia, this place stood in the west of Eurasia. They witnessed each other's development over 6,000 years of time. It was called Babylon. Thank you. 